second talk will be given by Bevel Kahan, um, a colleague at Berkeley once told me that asking Bevel Kahan a question is like trying to take a small sip of water from a fire hydrant. <laughs> So uh, there's a wealth of information and you get a lot of it. We'll see how it works out today. Uh, well, got his uh, education in Toronto mostly, spent some time in Cambridge, and I don't know the exact number, but talking of permanent jobs, I think he has been at Berkeley for at least 50 years. Uh, maybe he'll tell you how, how much it actually was. Uh, he'll be giving the talk sitting down because that's much easier for him. So the stage is yours still. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for letting me sit because I have trouble standing in now. Um, everything is on my web page. The text of this document that I'm going to go through now is there. And if you see that document, you'll be able to find where the details are. Now. Um, these are the topics I want to talk about. And it's artificial because I'm talking about a smooth function that I'd like to minimize. And you saw a graph that showed you that sometimes the functions are ragged, but that's because he didn't really add up enough error terms. Uh, with a lot of error terms, the, the graph actually gets a little bit smoother. Um, the problem is choosing hyperparameters. And that's what I'm going to try to concentrate on now. The question you see is, how fast can we go when we don't know how to choose the hyperparameters? And that's what I'll concentrate on. How fast can we go? But then there's a the question about, why do I care? Well, I think we care, I care, because we want the training algorithms to go as fast as possible. And it's important to know what limits the speed of a training algorithm and uh, how can you get close to the limit. Um, there's another reason for my wanting to talk about this, but I'll come to that later. The fact is we have an enormous amount of data. Our data amounts to millions of pictures or scenarios, and we have many thousands of parameters that we would like to choose to optimize the match of our uh, recognition system to the data. We can compute the gradient, but we can't compute very many of them. If we could compute lots of them, then we could estimate the Hessian of second derivatives, but we can't. There just isn't enough space and we can't compute the Hessian directly because it's too huge. So we have to use what are called gradient-based iterations. Gradient descent is an example. Gradient descent plus momentum, uh, that's been mentioned. Here's the momentum. And there are all sorts of variations that we'll talk about. But you see, there are these parameters. What is the step size here, sometimes called a learning rate? or else this can be called a learning rate, and this is a, a drag or a, a, a damping parameter, it's various names. How do you choose those parameters? Because it turns out they affect the speed. Now, it also turns out that these iterations can be construed as discretizations of differential equations. Now for gradient descent, here's the differential equation. Remember the gradient is the set of uh, the Jacobian array of first partial derivatives transposed. And the function we want to minimize declines along each trajectory. Because if I differentiate the function along a trajectory that satisfies this differential equation, it turns out that this is the rate at which it decreases as long as the gradient is non-zero. And so each trajectory terminates at a stationary point, a place where the gradient vanishes, and it's almost always a local minimum of the function. 
gradient descent plus momentum, uh, all those versions of it uh, have really the same differential equation. Uh, you can write it this way uh, as a pair of differential equations, and then V here amounts to the momentum. Associated with these is a pseudo-Hamiltonian. It's inspired by the thought that this is analogous to total energy. Here is the potential energy, and here is the kinetic energy. And that inspires the idea that, well, uh, this pseudo-Hamiltonian changes because of the drag here. And so it always decreases as long as the momentum is non-zero. But then, if the momentum doesn't change, well, in that case, uh, the derivative here doesn't change. And if that doesn't change, then we're at a stationary point. So, each trajectory ends at a stationary point. It's almost always a local minimum. Uh, I wonder what these trajectories look like. Well, for gradient descent in two dimensions, this is what they look like. Uh, as you get close to a minimum. If you're close enough to a minimum, they all bend very sharply. I've left out the ones that are coming out here because it was tedious to program them. In a space of high dimension, a dimension many thousands, then what these things turn into is twisted letters like L. Uh, that works also for gradient descent plus momentum with a lot of drag, but that's not what's usual. With lower drag, we get these spirals. That's in two-dimensional space. In a space of high dimensions, we end up with corkscrews, and the corkscrews combine with the twisted letter L, and so uh, things get a bit complicated. But what is important is that if I were to magnify this region here, and look at it with a microscope, and look at all the trajectories, they would look the same. So that this twisted nature and corkscrewing nature persists all the way down to a minimum. Now, we're going to have to use two different strategies, depending on, on where our iterates are. If they're not anywhere close to a minimum, that means that the curvature, which is determined by the Hessian we don't know, the curvature varies. It can be hyperbolic or ellipsoidal. And the hyperparameters don't really influence the iterations in a way that we can predict. It's just accidental. And so what we do is we choose step sizes small enough that we hope our iterates will follow a trajectory closely enough that they approach a minimum that's determined by where we start. And why does that matter? After all, we only care about the end of the trajectories. But, you see, if the function has more than one minimum, we might like some better than others. For example, we've mentioned overfitting. That occurs when we have a minimum which is very deep and narrow. Uh, it, that can be tr problematical. We'd really rather have a minimum which is broad. And even if we distribute our initial points partly randomly, if we choose step sizes that are too big, we increase the likelihood that some minima will be rediscovered repeatedly. Uh, that happens because of something called a basin of attraction. I won't go into it, but we can discuss it later if you want. Now, there is another strategy appropriate for what I call regime number one. That's when we're really close to a minimum. Now, the curvature, which is determined by this unknown Hessian, it's ellipsoidal, it varies relatively little, and then the hyperparameters determine the ultimate rate of convergence. I'll explain the word ultimate later. And in fact, this is all that matters, the norm of the Hessian and the condition number which is the product of the norm of the Hessian and the norm of its inverse. Sometimes, if you read the literature, you'll find these associated with Lipschitz constants, but you don't know them. Well, the trouble is that when the condition number is big and the hyperparameters are optimal, 
the step sizes are big enough that it hurts ricochet. They bounce around very wildly, even though they're converging as fast as possible. And the trouble is that this behavior is very difficult to distinguish from what happens when convergence is slow because you've not chosen the hyperparameters well, or even when convergence isn't there it, when you're diverging. It's very difficult to distinguish what's going on when the condition number is big. I suppose what this means is that you should try to avoid big condition numbers. Well, the trouble is, if you try to discriminate among faces, and faces look an awful lot like one another, the condition number will be big. The condition number says something about the independence of your categories. And so we've had uh, examples where, for instance, uh, the face of a dog slightly changed, got reclassified as an ostrich. Remember that? Well, uh, that's a situation that occurs when the condition number is very big, and it's because faces look so much one like another, if you have enough of them. But we don't know the Hessian, we don't know its norm nor the condition number. You almost never know it in advance, and so now we have a problem. How do you choose good hyperparameters in this regime? And, of course, to know that, we have to know how good would be good enough. So, let's see. How fast could we go if we had the best possible choices of hyperparameters in regime one? Now, because of its ricochet, they bounce around a lot, we have to measure in iterations ultimate rate of convergence. The rate of convergence is minus the logarithm of the shrinkage ratio. Rho is the average factor by which each of vastly many iteration steps, uh, they're called epochs in some contexts in artificial intelligence. What is the average factor by which each iteration reduces the gradient? because we want the gradient to go to zero. And of course, this can only be true starting from almost every initial iterate in regime number one when you're close. It turns out that this has been dealt with. There's a theorem by Szymanski which says that all those iterations that we're talking about, they must have a convergence ratio that's at least this big. And that's interesting Partly because if you do the obvious thing, instead of having C here, you'll have root C, you'll have C. For example, if you just use gradient descent and choose the optimal constant, then you'll have C instead of the square root of C here. So it's nice to know that you can really make enormous improvements even if the condition number is very big. It's possible even to achieve this rate. In fact, for optimally chosen constant hyperparameters, for some, not all, versions of gradient descent plus momentum, running close to the minimum, you get this optimal rate. Now, this is an average which a mathematician would say it's the limit superior that you would have for this ratio because you've got to have a very large number of iterations in order to be able to measure it. Of course, a very large number of iterations is not quite what we have in mind, but I'm sorry, that's what the theory says. There are two versions of gradient descent plus momentum that I want to talk about. Um, this is a very common version. This is the learning rate, and this is a sort of weight on this difference, which is thought of as the momentum, but you can also do it in two steps, so it doesn't really matter what you do. Um, what's important is that there is a constraint, a constraint that must be satisfied in order to get convergence at all. I'll compare this constraint with something later. And the optimal choices for alpha and beta, you can compute them, if only you knew the norm of the Hessian and its condition number, and you do get Szymanski's best bound. That's nice. There's an Androma gradient descent. is another version of gradient descent plus momentum. It looks something like Numeroff's scheme, but 
Numeroff doesn't have this division. And I'll explain anadromic later. Uh, this division means that this a very simple constraint, simpler than this, simple constraint for convergence. There are formulas for optimal choices that are a little bit bigger than the ones up here. And you still get the best convergence ratio. What it really amounts to is the anadromic gradient descent tolerates bigger step sizes than the gradient descent plus momentum. Uh, it tolerates any drag, whereas this guy doesn't tolerate any drag because this beta is constrained. Um, why don't I flip over to this picture? This is a contour a diagram using colors for altitude. The best choice of parameters is here for gradient descent plus momentum. And if you'd like to get roughly 50% of the best value, you've got to stay out of the green region. So you've got to stay in this little triangle. And if you get a little bit smaller on beta, there'll be a precipitous drop. And if you get a little bit too big, either a little bit too big in, in alpha, or paradoxically a little bit too small in beta, you'll drop off into divergence. On the other hand, if you use anadromic gradient descent, uh, there's a larger region where you stay within the bounds of green. Yes, there's a sharp drop off if the drag is a bit too big, um, but there's a very broad region here where the convergence ratio is pretty big. Nonetheless, if you make your step size or learning rate a little bit too big, boom, you're off in divergence. So I've promoted AGD in the past because it's easier to deal with when you have no idea what the parameters ought to be. And so you're going to play around. But the fact is, playing around is a bad business because it's so hard to tell whether the hyperparameters are good or not, since once you get into this region, the iterates ricochet. So we can't know what we wish we knew in advance. But there is a way, I think, to beat the fact that we're ignorant. You see, in, now we're in regime one. I want to talk about what happens when we're close to a minimum. This is a power series expansion, a couple of terms in powers of the step size delta t. And I've underlined in green, sorry, I've underlined in blue, these are the things we can't know. We can compute this and this and this, but we can't compute that. Ah, uh, alas. Still, what we observe is that this thing shrinks at a faster rate. It, it shrinks with delta tau cubed instead of squared, and it shrinks with a gradient cubed instead of squared. So this term gets small. It gets small as we get close to a minimum. Therefore, if I said I'd like to minimize f of nu x, <coughs> Excuse me. I'd like to minimize f of nu x. If only I had known these terms, which I could compute by subtraction from here, I'd be able to compute the delta tau that would minimize f of nu x. But alas, it's too late. You see, I can't compute f of nu x until I've already used this step size. So I don't know what step size will minimize f of nu x. I just know what step size would have minimized f of nu x if only I had known. It's a bit late, isn't it? There's the new step size. I've got a formula for it, and it, I can't use it because it's too late. All right, it's too late. Let's use it anyway. So here's what I do. If I'm deep in regime one, which means I'm close to a minimum, and that's what I'm going to use 
as my updating formula, it's ordinary gradient descent, but I compute the step size for the next step, the one after new x. And I compute it from this formula, and there's this maximum in here. Well, really, all I want to do is prevent things from going wild. I don't want this, the new step size to go nuts and be enormously greater than this fellow because of something like round off in, in computing this stuff. Well, if it happens too often, then maybe I should worry. I should worry either that the condition number is enormous, which is a really bad thing. If the condition number is enormous, then it's not just that convergence will be slow. You're going to find out, first of all, that you can hardly get accuracy. It's very difficult to get an accurate result. And secondly, you're going to discover that your categories are too closely related. So it's best to avoid an enormous condition number if you can. Computed from this formula, the step sizes fluctuate over this range, typically. And then the iteration has been observed to converge about as rapidly as Szymanski's best ratio. Now, I don't know why that happens. I've got an idea, but that's not a proof. I haven't explained it to my mathematical satisfaction, and there's a reason. It, partly because it doesn't always work that well. This scheme of computing delta tau from this formula for the next step, it has a failure mode. So, now, notice how I'm modifying. I'm just saying every now and then, at random, compute the new step size from this formula, not that one, just occasionally. And this thwarts a failure mode. Well, that's nice. It, I can explain it here, but it isn't worth spending time on it. What's important is that this will not change the ultimate rate very much. Now, does this scheme, does it have another failure mode? Well, I've looked for one, haven't found it. So, the scheme always converged as fast as I expected when I was close to minimum, deep in regime one. Ah, deep in regime one. How do I know that I'm in regime one? I've got to escape from regime zero and know it. You see, there's a problem. How do we know that we've gotten out of regime zero where nothing is predictable? After all, the Hessian, it, the curvature can be hyperbolic. In regime zero, anything can happen. So what I'm going to do is measure progress by how much gradient descent minimizes, how much it reduces the function I want to minimize. Now, if I were going to talk about gradient descent plus momentum, I'd have to talk about how much it reduces this uh, pseudo-Hamiltonian function. But I'm not going to do that today because it's really messy. The real fact is this. If the step size is small enough, then each one of these gradient descent steps changes f of nu x from this formula. Now, this formula is more complicated than I had before because the delta tau term occurs linearly here and cubically there. There's no quadratic term. It's an extremely obvious, unobvious formula. And now I can figure out something interesting. I can say, well, again, what delta tau would have minimized f of nu x? Of course, it's a little bit late to ask that question, isn't it? But maybe not, because you see, if f of nu x is bigger than f of x, that means that things have gotten worse, not better. And if things have gotten worse, then I really have to throw new x away. Just throw it away if this happens. And recompute new x, recompute it 
but with a new, smaller step size, smaller than straight delta tau. We'll use a curly delta tau, which will be smaller. Of course, the interesting question is, how much smaller? And there's a way to figure that out. You see, this big O of delta tau cube term, we know something about it. What we know is that it varies with delta tau cubed, it varies with the norm of the gradient squared, and then there's a coefficient there, I'm using the yen function, which doesn't seem to change very much, and what's more important, it's almost always positive. And therefore, what I can do is pretend that I can use this formula with delta tau in it to predict what f of nu x would be if I had used curly delta tau instead of straight delta tau. There's a graph that helps understand that. Here is f of x. And here is f of nu x, which is bigger. See, it's a little bit bigger. But there's a cubic curve, which is u-shaped, and here's the cubic curve. You see, delta tau cubed, delta tau linear. There it is. And look, there's the minimum. So I know now what delta tau to use when I recompute new x. So that's what I'm going to do. I have my f of new x, which I'm going to throw away because it's too big. I'm going to compute curly delta tau. There's, these are the formulas for computing it. Don't worry about the maximum for now. And then I'll have a big new x using curly delta tau instead of straight delta tau. And that should give me a smaller f of big new x. Now, on the other hand, maybe this wasn't such a bad choice. Maybe f of nu x is smaller than f of x. Well, use this formula anyway, except that now the maximum will become relevant because uh, the delta f here, that will be negative. So um, we really want to use the maximum in order that we not make the curly delta tau too much bigger than straight delta tau. Otherwise, we can get into troubles about recomputing. That's the reason for doing it. So here we are with a scheme. We know what to do if f increases in one step. We know what to do if f decreases in one step. We know how to compute a new delta tau. And you know what? It goes about as fast as anything else. In fact, it goes about as fast as if I had used gradient descent in regime one, which is not very fast, but goes about as fast as any other scheme I've tried. Now, still, there is this problem. When have we escaped from regime zero into regime one? Because only when I get into regime one, can I use the clever scheme that works with Szymanski's ratio? Well, here's her symptoms. These are symptoms that I've escaped from regime zero. Unfortunately, the symptoms are also symptoms of approach to a saddle point. Now, saddle points are really nasty things because if you get close to a saddle point, the gradient will be small, and you'll be taking a large number of steps in small steps in x space in order to get away from it, because ultimately the trajectories are repelled from a saddle point. But, you know, ultimately, well, ultimately can be quite a ways along. So, here is an inequality that might happen. This inequality might occur even though I don't know the stuff in blue. I don't know the Hessian. What I do know is that if the Hessian is not positive definite, 
And therefore, if the curvature is hyperbolic, there's a fair chance that this quantity will be negative. And then I'll say, uh-oh, I'm approaching a saddle point. So if ever this happens, or if the gradient norm increases, either stay in regime zero or go back to it. Now, what we would like to do is stimulate the detection of an escape from a saddle point. And here's the way we do that. We perturb nu x by a little bit at random. Just make it orthogonal to g of x and g of nu x. Uh, making a vector that's orthogonal uh, to two given vectors is relatively easy. And you do it while the gradient is small, but not yet so small that you'll call it zero. And then we have a better chance of having this inequality turn up when you approach a saddle point. And so there's a fair chance that maybe you'll know when you've escaped from regime zero. Except there might not be an escape from regime zero. Now, here is an example. Rosenbrock's banana. Uh, I met Rosenbrock in Cambridge in 1960, and he was very proud of this example because it blew up many of the optimization algorithms of that era. And here is why. You see, the curvature is hyperbolic there, and it's ellipsoidal here on the other side of a parabola, which is this dashed line. In fact, on this dashed line, the Hessian's determinant vanishes, and the inverse of the Hessian, which is what used to be used in the 60s, the inverse of the Hessian becomes an infinite, so it's numerically intractable. Even though the curvature is hyperbolic here, nonetheless, there are no saddle points. This is the only minimum. There it is. And if you want to get into regime one, you better get a lot closer to the minimum than this parabola. You better get deep inside this region. And now you can see why it might take a while, because when you look at your iterations in regime zero, they go bouncing around across, back and forth across the parabola. So I want you to know that I'm not offering you a panacea. I can't always guarantee that you'll be able to find the minimum very quickly. But in deep learning, this almost never happens. In deep learning, usually the different minima, their local minima, usually they're separated by a reasonable amount. They have ellipsoidal regions which are reasonable in size, they don't come close to the hyperbolic region. And so usually, this doesn't happen, I think. Usually. Well, I hope. So, we don't know the Hessian's norm nor its condition number, but we perform gradient-based iterations. We only compute the function and its gradient once per iteration step unless we have to recompute, which we hope is going to be rare. We compute step sizes from byproducts of F and G. They seem ultimately to achieve convergence at rates roughly as good as the best that any other scheme can expect, even if you know the Hessian's norm and condition number. Seem is not a mathematical proof. And ultimately means, after a large number of iterations, much larger, perhaps, than you have in mind. Maybe we'll all be dead. And so I don't want you to think that we've solved all the problems. However, uh, one problem that I think I have solved is this. I'm 86 years old. I'm not sure that I'm going to live long enough to figure out how to prove or disprove what's going on. But most of my audience are young people. Ah, maybe one of you will figure out either that I'm right or that I'm wrong and 
I would love to know. Now, there are lots of questions left. This anadrama gradient descent, this is a second order scheme. Uh, what this means as second order discretization, what it means is that the departure from a trajectory is of the order of the square of the step size, whereas for gradient descent and also for all the other versions of gradient descent plus momentum, they're all first order. And so the departure from a trajectory is of the order of just the step size to the first, first power. So anadrama gradient descent should stick closer and should therefore allow us to use longer steps and fewer of them. Except that I don't want to stick close to a trajectory. I just want to get to the end of it. So there are some interesting questions about whether that's going to help. I'd really like to have lots more examples. And then there are questions about how much accuracy and when you should quit. And why is one computed minimum better than another? That's a worthwhile discussion. And then, what's wrong with stochastic gradient descent? Yes, I know in the previous talk, John said, gee, that'll go 10,000 times as fast. Ah, yes, it's based upon a probabilistic hypothesis that's very fragile. We might have a discussion about that. But what weighs upon my mind is this. You see, I'm a mathematician, and I pray at the temple of proof. And I don't have a proof. And besides, the step size delta tau, it's not small. And the gradient doesn't get small until near the end. So why does this scheme work? I don't know. Maybe some of you guys will be able to tell me. Um, I have here, you know, I have to say thanks. Well, this is where you'll find it on my web page. But the greatest amount of thanks that I owe won't fit on the slide because I owe it to my wife, who has been my faithful companion for over 65 years. And I wouldn't have been able to do this uh, without her support. So, questions, I'm ready for some. So, thank you for this wonderful talk. Now, are there questions? Snowed, well, eh? <laughs> uh, Dr. Baggio, in his uh, first talk, said that in high dimensions, you have very few local minima and lots and lots of saddle points, and he said that's a good thing. And I'm trying to uh, make that consistent with what you said, which is that saddle points are bad things and local minima are good things. Can you say anything about that? Well, the hypothesis that I've used as an approximation is that we're minimizing a smooth function. And although the function may not be smooth when you look at it microscopically, if you look at it in a larger distance, uh, it, it generally looks smooth enough. Um, yes, there can be a lot of saddle points, but remember, the saddle points are repulsive. So as long as you know when you're getting close to a saddle point, that, whoops, you haven't escaped yet from regime zero. Uh, all that happens <coughs> is that you just keep on going. You see, in regime zero, the scheme always accepts a step when you reduce the function, the target function f. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to reduce it fast, it may take a long, long time, as it does with um, th this banana-shaped curve. Uh, 
I, I, I don't offer a lovely way to compute minima really fast all the time. Can't. What I'm offering is a way to compute minima about as quickly as anybody else can, but faster when you get close enough to a minimum. That we can do, and we can do it without knowing the Hessian's norm nor its condition number. Of course, if the condition number is rather big, you're going to be unlucky in many more ways than slow. Not only will convergence be slow, you'll converge to a grubby answer contaminated by round off. And in any event, really, if the condition number is big, it means that you've chosen the categories that you would like your system to discriminate in an unlucky way because the categories aren't sufficiently different. Is there one more question? Yes. Thank you for the lecture. So you talked about the Rosenblatt's banana, um, Rosenblock's banana, and how that does not appear in deep learning. Why do you think that is the case? Is it just an intuition you have, or have you done any experiments, or do you have some seemingly mathematical proof? Um, let's go back to that. Rosenbrock's banana has the unfortunate property that if you increase a parameter, it's called b up here. There's a parameter. If you increase it, you can get the parabola on which the Hessian's determinant vanishes to come as close to the minimum as you like, and you can get these uh, pseudo-ellipsoids approximate, you can get them to be as narrow as you like and to come as close as you like to the parabola. Now, um, that doesn't normally happen as far as I know. Um, it is certainly possible to have lots of saddle points, but I don't know of a situation where this turns up in um, deep learning. But uh, maybe it's, I just haven't run enough experiments. And I'd love to have you run experiments using the schemes and tell me if you find something else. It would be nice to know. Okay. Before we thank the speaker, uh, I want to remind you of the picture session now. Uh, Andreas, you want to say something about it? or? Okay, let's thank this speaker. Yeah, please uh, come up to the stage for the group photo. Um, tomorrow morning, the buses to SAP Waldorf will leave at 8 o'clock from the university square. And everybody, except those of you who are staying at the Hotel Europäischer Hof, they have a separate transportation, but everybody else is welcome to join the buses. Um, except for the buses, there is no separate means of getting there, uh, at least with the aid of HLF. You would do it, have, to do it, have to do it by yourself. Um, please be back at uh, 2.30 for Schwedak Patel's talk. And those of you who are participating in the poster flash should be back at 2.15 already, just to get things organized and uh, make a smooth transition from Patel's talk to uh, poster flash. Okay, please come up to the stage.